Now, Hope, Healing, and Help with Ron Harder, sponsored by Heritage Oaks Memorial Chapel. Welcome, this is Ron Harder, and you're listening to Hope, Healing, and Help. And I'm here to share with you how you can deal with your grief and move from mourning to joy. We come to you as fellow travelers on the journey of grief, having lost our son Zachary to drowning in 2006, lost both my parents and a number of close friends, and so I am acquainted with grief, and I think that allows us then to share with you. And today we want to let you know you're not alone, and we're going to give you some more tools to help you on your journey. I have on the phone with me the author R. Glenn Kelly. I know him as Ron. That's what the R is all about. And we met at a bereaved parents gathering in Indianapolis late last month. I appreciated so much what he had to share about his own grief and experience and how men and women grieve differently. So I invited him to come on the show. Welcome, Ron. It's good to have you on with us today. Well, thank you, Ron. It, it's actually my pleasure to be here. Well, you know, I guess you're calling in from Tennessee, Balmies, Tennessee, right? I am sure I am, where the uh, the temperature has no problem with going higher and higher. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we have air conditioning, huh? Hey, hey, brother, it's just good to have you with us. And I think, of course, it's very important today to talk a little bit about uh, your son, Jonathan, and and what happened, and give us the background story and lead us up to the loss uh, oh, I of Jonathan. Would be- so glad to do that. I, I love talking about Jonathan. Jonathan was my hero. I, uh, I am his father. I'll always be his father. And, and unfortunately, uh, he was called home in June of 2013. He was such a little hero. He was born uh, with a condition known as hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is a very scientific word for saying that the left side of his heart failed to develop in the womb. And while it's uh, a rare heart condition, it's certainly not rare enough. Um, you know, we were uh, handed Jonathan on the first day of his life and told he might not make it uh, make it through the night. But uh, between his will to survive and, and God's answers to prayers, he did. Uh, he made it for 16 and a half years before his heart failed on him. Uh, during those 16 and a half years, uh, there was so much research on, on not only his heart, but on his incredible recovery from uh, some of the surgeries they did to reconstruct his heart so it functioned on just two chambers. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. And he served so many other children that he never met, um, you know, in ways that, that hopefully their lives uh, will go on longer because of what they learned about my son. Uh, I, can't, I can't get away from the fact that, uh, you know, I say this in jest, but I say it a little bit from the heart, that in a way he kind of, uh, he kind of cheated me out of leaving uh, his legacy, or my legacy to him. He left his legacy to me. So now I, I use that, and I do what he did, uh, and that is to go out and serve. Well, I know you said at, in your seminar that um, he was going in for um, a really quite a simple procedure, and it went bad. Can you talk yeah, a little it, bit it, about that? There, there are always inherent risks to, to anything. Gosh, we hear about some of the horror stories from you know plastic surgery. He had gone in for a heart catheterization. And part of that was to, to just kind of poke around. Uh, there are parts of his heart that, that uh, don't develop because they aren't natural parts of the heart. And uh, he had some issues with uh, drops in, in oxygen saturation where they would go up and, and just sort of, you know, for, for lack of a better term, and I hope the doctors forgive me, but tweak him a little bit. He'd been through it before. Yeah. Um, so he went through that procedure very, very well. Uh, it came out uh, into recovery as we had done, I, I, you know, I, I hearken to say dozens of times before. Um, but uh, during recovery, his heart failed. And uh, I had gone after that. Many people thought that I was going after a lawsuit when I, when I actually uh, went and enlisted a, a very, very heavy law firm just to collect all the documents and give them to an independent medical board who said uh, it was just his time. And I was, I was relieved in that. God had called him home, and, and that gave me great relief. So you were there on, when that happened? I, I was. I held him as he passed. Wow. I'm sure that's um, that was hard, and I know you talk uh, so wonderfully about your son Jonathan and how he was and is your hero for what he went through and how he's made it possible for other children to live a longer life because of the things they learn through his heart. Absolutely, absolutely. You know that is really 
an awesome legacy that he left behind. You know, the loss of your child was just three years ago, and, and so many of them that set on a mission to support other grievers are more seasoned. Why did you become dedicated so soon after your loss? Well, and, and I talk about this, and, and as you know, and, and as we'll probably talk about uh, either now or sometime in the future, I I focus a lot of my workshops and seminars on male grief and, and male versus female grief and, and how you know men do grieve uh, equally as women just in different ways. However, I had an issue where I actually went through a period of what's known as repressed grief, and yes, I, I know you're familiar with that, but... I'd had some issues and loved my father and my mother dearly. Uh, I had some guilt issues because I didn't visit enough. And, of course, when they both passed, uh, I would repress that grief because in order to think about their passing, I'd, I'd have to think about the guilt behind not visiting them as much as I should have because I, could, I, I, I certainly could have. I just did not, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, so when my mother passed in 2003, I was able to repress the grief and survive uh, what I thought was surviving, pardon me. Um, and then in 2013 or 2011, I lost my father to cancer. And I was able to uh, to repress that grief. And, and I originally thought when Jonathan passed, and I was able to repress Jonathan's grief, that it was a manly thing to do. It wasn't later until I, I really learned that that wasn't even part of male grief. That was part of a problem that I had with repression. But, uh, you know, the title of my first book is Sometimes I Cry in the Shower. And it was six months after Jonathan had passed. And, uh, you know, in the shower one morning, uh, after I'd failed to even grieve his passing for six months, uh, he and God came to me in the shower, and, and, you know, there were no spoken words. I could just feel him, and and John said, how dare you? How dare you not grieve me? Wow. From that point forward, I wanted to understand what I was going through. And I had set out to discover uh, many, many things. It just, you know, at first there were... uh, Literally, not that much on male grief. Uh, there's a lot of things out there for, for mothers. There's a lot for wives. There's a lot for kids. And, and bless it all for being there. I'm so glad that there's so much material out there. But, you know, that male ego part of mine, and I say this all the time, uh, you know, I was dealing with a male ego as well, knew that I wasn't going to go seek uh, any type of professional help. I, w- I was not going to lay on anybody's couch, and, and I don't condone my actions. And if somebody will, please go seek uh, help from a mental health professional, but I knew I wasn't. So uh, I also knew that I could go out and look for a book, and I really couldn't find anything on male grief. So I, I turned to going back to the foundations. Um, I joke all the time about John Gray's uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I, I went a little deeper than that, but at the same time, that's really what it came down to, is let me learn the differences in between men and women. And, and Ron, there were so many aha moments. And as I started to realize that, that I was actually moving forward, which is why I love your mission of hope, healing, and help, because if the first thing you do is talk about hope for your future. When I, when I instantly realized that there was hope for my future, I, I, I knew I had to do something with it. I knew I had to live my child's legacy. And you know, for several years before he passed, I had been working for a defense contractor where I had been writing proposals. And Some of those proposals were valued at over $350 million on the award. And I thought to myself, you know, if I could do that for somebody else, why can't I write to help somebody else? And as I began to write and as I began to publish, um, and real quick, I know I'm taking up a good time. No, no, let's let's hear about uh, it. As I began to to publish, I had an editor editor who would tell me, you know, women are going to love this book. And and I said, well, that's fine, but I'm not writing it for women. I'm writing it for men. And, and the comment came again that women are going to love this book. They, they really want to know what their men are going through. And I said, well, I don't care. I'm writing it for my buddies. <laughs> and it turns out that, that so many women have been so grateful because they just say, I have, I have always wanted to know what my man is going through inside. And they're, they're so pleased to find out that, that men are grieving equally, just in a different manner. And it, it means so much to the women to, to realize that it's there's no difference in the amount of love for a lost loved one. There's you know it's just the way that we do it. Yeah, and and we're going to get into that more uh, just uh, uh, so people understand you better. Um, understand that you were a marine. Of course, once a marine, always a marine. I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I was. <laughs> then you became what after that. Uh, I became a cop after that. I went back home to my hometown just outside of Washington, D.C., 
And uh, I did that until 9-11, and, and after 9-11, I, I felt a, a higher calling as far as trying to help out someplace and took a five-year personal service contract uh, with a uh, U.S. State Department, Diplomatic Security Service. So uh, I think you're alluding to the fact that at one time in my life I had a pretty big ego. <laughs> yes, I I think that that is uh, important for our guys to understand, okay, because I want you guys to know we're not dealing with a wimpy guy here, okay? I mean, this is a guy that fought for his life and for other people's and protected them, and, uh, you know, he was a pretty tough pretty tough dude here, you know, and so I, I think it's important for guys to understand that. Now, I understand also that that in this process of God working in your life, yeah. there was there was some time where he was kind of working on you and then did some more things to comfort you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and it's almost, you know, if I refer back to the cop days, it was, you know, if they were to film God in my life, it would be a Keystone Cops moment because I think, uh, and and thank him for being such a patient God because he Amen. did chase me around and he dropped, Breadcrumbs, or breadcrumb after breadcrumb, and you know there are times in our lives where we're, we get so busy and, and we're so wrapped up in other things we don't see what God is doing for us. And, and you know, praise the Lord, He is there all the time. But He He has lived in my life since childhood, and I have not lived in His as much as I should have back then. And um, uh, you know, there were times early on when when John was going through some major. Uh, and, and I'll go back a little bit, before he was two and a half years of age, because they had to reconstruct his heart to function on two chambers, there were a series of open-heart surgeries on his on his poor little soul. And uh, there were three open-heart surgeries because the procedure was too invasive to do it all at one time. It was too much for his body to take. And uh, we had our dear pastor just popping up at all times when, you know, you wouldn't expect a pastor to pop up, and he wasn't there looking for us. And you know, unfortunately, we hadn't told him that we were going to be there, and he would still show up. And um, he had made, and I'll make this brief, he had made a, a comment the first time he accidentally ran across us in the hospital, and Jonathan was doing so poorly after, no, before surgery, before his first surgery, but Jonathan was, uh, he was sick, and uh, we were waiting on his first surgery, and the pastor prayed with us. And he made the comments that, that uh, and over and over and over again in his prayer, that that, uh, that God should send only the best hands to care for John, only the best hands. And uh, that very day, we found out that uh, the number two pediatric cardiology surgeon, or cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, was right there in that small town hospital we had gone to to take Jonathan because his fever had spiked. Isn't and that amazing? At that moment, and I'm sorry, if there's a number one out there, yeah. bless his heart for being number one. <laughs> I think at this point, number two was was something God might have said, all right, this is good enough, take him. <laughs> um, so, I mean, to be number two in this, this man was, was doing the work of God. He he did miraculous things with my son, especially uh, to be told that uh, he might not make it through the night a short time before that to find out that he was going to live a relatively normal life. Isn't that amazing? You know, and I guess I would just add a comment here to you pastors that might be listening. Those those prayers in the hospital do make oh, a difference, gosh. and uh, and don't give up on that. That's really critical. So so God comforted you. How how was that? And what is your relationship with Him now? It was it was very comforting once I realized what was going on. I, and the pastor again was was um, I think he was so insightful, and God was directing him because uh, I think the final touch was when. He allowed John. He allowed the pastor basically to baptize Jonathan and I on a uh, Easter morning when uh, Jonathan was in intensive care. He just recovered from his third and final surgery, or he was in recovery from his third and final surgery. Uh, and, and the pastor came in and said, T "Today we're going to do the baptism." And from that point forward, I, I knew that God had said, I, "I don't need to chase you anymore. You're here." Um, but I was baptized Lutheran. I grew up Southern Baptist, so I know that we're talking about a dichotomy there. But I've enjoyed the Lutheran faith quite a bit and enjoyed being a member of the Lutheran Church where I live here. Uh, Jonathan certainly enjoyed being a member of the church, and, and uh, you know, he got to be the uh, the soundboard operator, so uh, <laughs> he enjoyed controlling the, the pastor's mic, which uh, he took great pleasure in doing. But uh, I went on to have what I can only uh, say is, is my personal relationship with God, and we all have that. Um, we certainly do. Uh, I've gone on to uh, do a self-study on the Bible, um, for a while, I was doing the Bible on on a tape on my iPhone, which was 
irritating because as you drive, you tend to wander, and if you have to back up, you have to back up a full chapter, and you can't just back up a verse. But we did it, and uh, and I've done a lot of self-study. And my life, uh, going out and serving others and working with wonderful people like you who you know, I will learn so much from, I think is a mission that God has sent me on, and, and there is no fear. Well, you know, I think it's exciting because I was reading there in the in your book, and I don't have the chapter number, but but uh, how that you came to personal faith in Christ, and and the Holy Spirit became real to you in your life, and and I think that's been uh, an important part of God's leading you, um, because as you've done your research, you have found a lot of different things, and and you know, let's talk a little bit about this whole issue of. Do men and women really grieve so differently? And uh, what have you learned, and what would you like to start sharing? Well, you know what, and I'll preface this with something that will surprise most people, and, and that's the fact that the research has shown, just by studying and mapping the brain, that men experience twice the amount of emotions that women do. Wow. Is that surprising? Yeah, it is. But you wouldn't think that from the onset, would you? Because men do not show it. Okay. They? No, they don't. So men are, and I think it's easy to see, men are more internal while women are external. And it's, it's, if you can get over the fact that, that it's always going to be like that, and, and I always tell people that, that either God had a sense of humor or God knew exactly what he was doing when he made us polar opposites of each other. We actually complement each other in that way, but in times of stress we have a tendency of uh, uh, letting that get in our way. Um, we can talk in it in great length, but you know, while a man is is grieving more internally, he's also more systematic and more. You know, he's got to do something. There's got to be an action. There's got to be something when a tragedy comes along. So he's almost, um, and there's no good word to say it, but he's almost relieved that he has things that have to be done right after the passing of a loved one. Plans have to be made. Pastors have to be got up with. Uh, eulogies have to be written. And because he's not crying. The woman who is more external and who is very empathetic and, and lives off of the emotions of others is looking at her, and let's just say looking at her husband. And she might have a tendency to go, well, he's not crying like I am crying, and therefore he must not have loved the child as much as I. Now, I'm going to the extreme, so you'll uh, uh, allow me to go there for just a minute. So he must not have loved the child as much as I, and therefore she's got a little resentment in her mind. While he's trying to take care of the things that have to be done, because that's the, the instinct of the male is to take care of these things, he's looking at her saying, I can't get anything done because you're crying on my shoulder all the time. Now, you know, yeah, that's interesting because I, I think even sometimes I, I have a men's grief group, and one of the gentlemen was telling me that the, he'll want to start talking to his wife about grief, and she gets caught up in the grief so much that it kind of cuts him off. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. But I, I, and I do want, I want you to know, and I want the audience to know, that, that we do paint with a broad brush when we talk about this. We just, we realize that we talk in generalities, and, and I always say that, you know, in general, we all know that men are taller than women. However, we do know that there are some women that are taller than men. So, you know, we're living in an environment where my grief is different from your grief. I call it snowflakes and fingerprints. We're, we're all unique in our grief, but we're all unique as people, too. So we can only talk in generalities. But for the most part, yes, I mean, women are, are far more empathetic and, and far more outwardly emotional about their grief than men are going to be. But the good part of this, um, and, and even those that have been on our journey, even those that you and I meet when we go and do these national conferences, they they still are under the impression that that uh, you know the loss of a close loved one like this could result in uh, divorce between a couple. You know they think that the generalities out there are the fact that it's so rough that that many couples end up in divorce when you know the the studies show that only fifteen percent and let's take children fifteen percent of a couple that or fifteen percent of couples that have lost a child wind up in divorce, and then in that 15%, the vast majority had underlying conditions that were in play before the loss. So it's the love and the, and, the, and the love and support we get from God for each other that actually holds us together when we have a loss. Does that make sense? Oh, I think it very much so does. And I think our background, both negative and positive, uh, affect the relationship. 
Sure. You know, if if we have drawn together in other times of hard hard issues or losses or prayed together or spent time in the Word together, it it makes a big difference. And when we have been alienated, maybe from each other or very independent of each other, then it can lead to greater distance and and uh, separation. So. One of the other things, and we'll talk more about this, I'd like us to think a little bit about this whole thing of men compartmentalizing their life as yes. opposed to women. Do you see that to be the case? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I think, Ron, talking to you now, I, I can I can give you a hundred different examples of my compartmentalizing, and I think if, if I were to ask you, you could probably do the same. I think, on general, any man that calls in could tell you, uh, you know, there there are parts in our brain that we have to go to when you ask me about something. But if you don't ask me about it, they just stay there. Whereas women, bless their hearts, I mean, they they don't have to go anywhere to think about anything. It's always right there. It's it's they're always ready to to touch on any subject. So there are, and it's interesting to hear uh, people like Gray and some others that, that are actually into the scientific study of the brain where they'll tell you that the hypothalamus is larger and there are certain things, but it really comes down to what our observations have been with women, and we realize that we are complementary, but but so different. And that's, you know, and, and praise God for the difference. You know, yeah. I think that, you know, you think about Genesis and what, in the whole creation model there that God gave us, that that man was made, uh, and he and she, man, women came along, and it fit the right. man, you know. And I think that's that's emotionally too, and I and I'm glad for that. I think we just need to encourage each other to pull together, and to seek to understand the other person's grief and how they're dealing with it without being critical. Absolutely, and, and realize that that should a, a a profound loss, and, and gosh knows that we don't want it to happen. But should a profound loss happen, it is that love for each other that will see you through and help you on a path, uh, and, and help you find that hope for the future. Well, that's it, you know, and that's part of the reason why you're doing what you're doing, and I'm doing what I'm doing. I know that you've written a number of books. The one that I have in my hand right here, sometimes I cry in the shower is kind of your story of your journey, isn't it? It is. It, 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 chronicles, uh, it chronicles Jonathan's condition. It chronicles what we went through together. Uh, it starts out, of course, with um, you know chapter one, where Jonathan came to me in spirit and, and said, how dare you? And uh, you know, it was from that point forward that I began uh, mapping down what I discovered and, and you know, how I got to the point where I am uh, it, it, at the end of the book. And then I think what really plays along well with, with your mission is is by the time I had finished that book and by the time I had gotten involved with so many different organizations out there, I realized that now it's about moving forward. Now it's about healing. We, we realize what has happened, but we realize that, that, that God had a plan for our loved one and, and God has a plan for us. Uh, if we're not up there with God and our loved one, it means that our plan here is not finished. Well, as, as, amen. Well, as you can hear the music, um, I'll just say to the folks that are here listening to us that you can go to our website, hopehealinghelp.com, and we're going to have information on there about Ron and his books and how you can order. But I'm going to ask Ron to come back and share more thoughts next week on the subject of men and women grieving differently because I think there's several more things that we can go over in this area. Just remind you what our, our theme verse is, is Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just remember, Hope, Healing, and Help,